How are you doing, everybody? Appreciate the rousing welcome today. Nice to see you all. We can go straight to your questions. Jim, do you want to get us started? Uh, thank you, Josh. Um, President Putin today gave a lengthy interview, and uh, he says he wants to be treated as an equal partner by the West. Um, how does the White House view Russia? Is it an equal partner? And uh, the President once dismissed Russia as a regional power, uh, wondering if that's the kind of uh, perhaps dismissive view of, of Russia that Putin has taken to heart. Well, uh, well I'll say a couple things come to mind. The first is simply that we have acknowledged on a number of occasions that Russia has played an important role alongside the P5 plus one in our negotiations with Iran to try to carve a diplomatic pathway that would prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, Russia has played a, a constructive role in that effort. And uh, you'll recall that even earlier this week, the Russian foreign ministry put out a helpful statement uh, indicating that the uh, document outlining the parameters of the political framework that was announced two weeks ago uh, was consistent with the agreement that was reached at the negotiating table. Uh, that means they, uh, that Russia has been an active participant in those discussions and, and helpful. Um, what's also true is that Russia uh, has been helpful in other circumstances. The other thing that comes to mind is the assistance that Russia provided in negotiating with and assisting in the destruction of Syria's declared chemical weapons stockpile. That was an example of the United States working closely with Russia uh, to reach a goal that was clearly in the best interests of the region and the world. Russia has particular influence uh, with the Syrian regime, and they use that influence to good effect. What's also true is that there are expectations for influential world powers. One of those expectations is that they are going to respect the borders of sovereign countries. And right now, we see that the Russian government has time and again over the course of the last year flagrantly violated the sovereignty of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and we have seen Russian military activity uh, inside of eastern Ukraine in support of separatists. Uh, that is not at all consistent with the kind of behavior that you would expect uh, of a world power. And uh, that, that is not just the opinion of the United States. Uh, that's the opinion of a substantial number of other legitimate world powers that have imposed sanctions uh, and tried to negotiate around the table with President Putin and other senior members of the Russian government to de-escalate the situation uh, in Ukraine, to get the Russians to remove their military forces out of Ukraine, to stop moving weapons and materiel across the border, uh, and to uh, facilitate a genuine diplomatic discussion or political discussion between uh, the separatists in Ukraine and the Ukrainian government. Does Russia's decision, you addressed this earlier this week, but Russia's decision to supply Iran with a, a, a powerful uh, missile system, combined with Putin's comments today, suggests that maybe the unity of the uh, P5 plus one that you discussed uh, earlier this week is in fact in danger. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. And, and even uh, President Putin, uh, I'm told, in the context of his very long uh, program today, uh, indicated that he was committed to preserving unity with the P5 plus one. The, we have raised, you've heard from me and you've heard from others in the U.S. government, the concerns that we have about the sale of this defensive weapon system from Russia to Iran. Uh, we've made that concern, we've relayed that concern directly to senior officials in the Russian government. So this is not just a message that we've delivered publicly, it's one that we've delivered privately as well. The transfer of this defensive weapon system, however, is not uh, prohibited uh, by UN Security Council resolutions. And we would need to know more about the specific program to determine the impact it would have on U.S. sanctions programs. It's, as I said earlier this week when asked about this, I would hesitate to speculate on the thought process behind the decision to complete this sale, 
there are some who have speculated that Russia has engaged in this transaction simply because they need the money, that the sanctions that we put in place against Russia because of their interference in Ukraine has had a pretty significant impact on their economy. And the latest illustration of that is from the uh, IMF's latest projections that were just released this week that indicate that Russia's real GDP, the Russian economy this year, is predicted to contract by 3.8 percent. So it isn't a particular surprise that, um, that Russia may be pretty desperate to generate some income. Uh, and I do think it actually does uh, indicate that Russia's willingness to engage in a controversial transaction like this one uh, is an indication of how weakened their economy has become. On, on Iran, um, with talks, I believe, scheduled to restart next week, uh, I wanted to go back to something the President said on Saturday in his press conference, which was uh, when asked about the comments that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini made. Uh, he suggested that that was that politics was driving that internal politics in Iraq, uh, that there were hardliners, and that in the end uh, that might not end up being the final position that Iran takes in these negotiations. A month ago, when Prime Minister Netanyahu said that uh, that under his watch there would be no Palestinian state during the heat of the campaign. And then he later walked those comments back. The president still said that he believed the president or the prime minister's comments at that time. I'm curious why the Ayatollah gets the benefit of the doubt on his remarks, but Netanyahu does not. Well, this is the thing, Jim. The Ayatollah does not get the benefit of the doubt. We have indicated time and time again that these negotiations with the Iranians are not built on trust. The foundation of these talks uh, is ensuring that there are verification measures in place to confirm their compliance with the agreement, that there is no indication that um, it would be in the best interest of the international community to just take Iran's word for it. In fact, what will be required, uh, in addition to serious commitments by Iran to roll back key aspects of their nuclear program are, uh, is compliance with the most intrusive set of inspections that have ever been imposed on a country's nuclear program. So this is not a matter of, uh, of taking, uh, accepting the word of the Iranian leadership. In fact, we've been pretty blunt about our approach to these negotiations being distrust and verify. Uh, and that is going to continue to be our approach. The one sign of encouragement that we have seen is that Iran did make commitments in the context of this political framework, but there is a significant amount of work that remains. And uh, it, that will begin next week when, um, as the EU has announced, when the political directors uh, will meet in Vienna. There will be a plenary meeting of all P5 plus one political directors. Uh, and then there'll be you know, more engagement. I'm sorry, there'll be a plenary meeting of all the P5 plus one political directors as well as the EU and Iran uh, at the end of next week. Uh, in parallel to that, we'll have the technical experts uh, sitting down working to continue to finalize uh, the framework. So um, you know, the fact of the matter is this is a, this is a diplomatic negotiated uh, agreement that will require the Iranians to make both serious commitments uh, and demonstrate a willingness to cooperate with the most intrusive inspections that have ever been imposed on a nuclear program to verify that they're living up to those commitments. And, and regarding the relationship with, the, uh, with Israel, uh, last month you know, said you, because of the Prime Minister's comments, you were reevaluating uh, the U.S. approach toward the Middle East. Have you, after a month, have you come up with what that approach should be? Well, what we have done over the course of the last month is continue to keep the lines of communication open uh, with our partners in Israel on a variety of, uh, of issues. And you know, I don't have any policy changes or anything like that to announce today. Uh, but you know, we're going to continue to keep those lines of communication open. Obviously, the other thing that we have indicated is that the next step is for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to go about the important work of forming the new uh, Israeli government. And uh, that's, an, that's a process that, uh, that continues. And we're going to keep the lines of communication open that even as they undertake that process. Okay.
Jeff? Josh, has the Saudi government uh, indicated to the White House of the United States any plans to start ground operations in Yemen? And if it did, is that something that the White House would support? Uh, I, don't, I don't have any um, communications between the U.S. and our partners, partners in Saudi Arabia to read out at this point. Uh, what Saudi Arabia has undertaken so far is, has been an air campaign uh, against Houthi forces that are destabilizing the region along their southern border. And those are actions that the Saudis have taken uh, with the support of other countries in the region, other GCC countries. Uh, the United States, uh, the Saudis asked uh, the United States to offer some assistance, and we have complied with that request uh, in the form of providing intelligence and logistical support to their ongoing operation. Uh, but what we have always believed uh, and continue to impress upon uh, everyone involved in this situation is that our goal is to try to bring about a political resolution to the conflict uh, and that there are many grievances on the part of many parties in that country. And it is in the clearest security interest of every country that's partaking here uh, for this political resolution to be reached. Uh, and that is the best way for us to try to bring some stability to the situation and also succeed uh, in rooting out the extremists that are trying to foment instability, uh, not just in Yemen, but across the region. Would the United States support Saudi Arabia expanding its campaign from the air to the ground? Well, uh, we've not seen an indication publicly from the uh, Saudis that that's uh, precisely what they're planning. But the United States is closely coordinating with the Saudis as they plot the military aspects of this operation. The new uh, Yemeni vice president expressed some concern that that's something that was on the cards. Well, again, I, I, I don't have any, uh, uh, any comment on you know, what, the, what the Saudis may be uh, considering or planning. You can ask them if, uh, and they may be able to provide you more insight into their thinking as they uh, consider this dangerous security situation. And on one other issue, today um, is Greek Independence Day. Um, it is. Speaking of, how <laughs> confident is the White House that Greece will reach an agreement with its creditors by the end of this month? Well, Jeff, what we have uh, indicated is that it is uh, in the best interest not just of the Greek people, uh, but all of the nations of the EU uh, to resolve this situation in an orderly fashion. Uh, there are obviously a, a, a large number, this is obviously an extraordinarily complex uh, situation, and we have experts over at the Treasury Department that, frankly, for years uh, have been working closely with their counterparts in, Greek, uh, in Greece uh, and throughout Europe uh, as they uh, work through what is an extraordinarily complex but also high-stakes situation uh, that uh, the world economy and certainly the U.S. economy benefits from uh, the uh, quiet resolution uh, of these challenges. Uh, and we have uh, taken many steps to try to encourage and foster uh, that kind of resolution. Um, and uh, we'll continue to do that. The Greek finance minister is coming to the reception this evening. We understand. I've heard. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> uh, we understand he's not meeting with the president. That's correct. Is Thank he, you for stipulating as such. Is he meeting anyone else <laughs> at the White House? Uh, I'm not aware of any formal meetings that he has uh, at the White House. I wouldn't rule out that he might see some uh, senior administration officials who will be partic uh, partaking in the festivities today. Uh, but I'm not aware of any specific formal meetings. Now, I know what's also true is it's not uncommon when the Greek, fi minister, Greek finance minister is in town for the IMF World Bank meetings that he would, for example, uh, have a meeting with the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Uh, I'm not aware uh, of what uh, Secretary Liu's schedule is today. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if the two men uh, do have a meeting while he's in town, but you can check with the Treasury Department about that. Okay. Mark? Yeah, Josh, are there any uh, lessons to be learned from the gyrocopter incident on the mm -hmm. mall yesterday? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are a number of temptations that are associated with the uh, posing of that question. I'll try to resist them. Um, what I will say is that the uh, Secret Service uh, takes very seriously the responsibility that they have to uh, protect the President, uh, to protect the White House, to protect those of us who work at the White House, to protect the airspace above the White House. Uh, and they obviously are dealing with a very dynamic 
challenging security environment. Uh, not only is there all kinds of new technology uh, that they have to be prepared for, uh, but there are also threats that emanate from a lot of different places. And they have to balance all of those concerns with the priority of ensuring that the public continues to have access to the White House. Uh, and there are hundreds of thousands of people who uh, come through the White House uh, every year uh, on tours or for events like Greek Independence Day. Uh, and balancing the need to, to uh, protect the President, protect the White House with the need to preserve that openness uh, is a central part of their mission. Uh, it's a mission that I know they take very seriously. I also know that they take very seriously the responsibility that they have uh, to work with other law enforcement agencies, uh, whether that's the Metropolitan Police Department here in the District of Columbia uh, or the Capitol Police uh, up on Capitol Hill to ensure that all those agencies are sharing information about threats that may exist. So uh, I'm confident that there will be um, you know, a careful look uh, at this incident. Uh, and uh, while we certainly are pleased that uh, no one was harmed uh, in, the, uh, in this incident, uh, it may provide an opportunity for uh, law enforcement agencies, including the Secret Service, uh, to review their procedures and uh, to get some useful lessons from it. Can you tell us about the President's reaction to it? First of all, when was he told about it? Was, he, was there any alert while this thing was in the air that caused the President to be notified? Uh, I don't know that he was notified right away because he was on the road when it occurred. He was not in Washington when it occurred. Uh, but he was, uh, he was informed uh, on the trip by the military aide who was traveling alongside him. I wasn't on the trip, so I didn't see his uh, initial reaction. It might have been, what's a gyrocopter? I know that was my reaction. Uh, but, I, but beyond that, I don't know uh, what his reaction was. So I guess I failed in my resisting the temptation uh, in your question. Uh, John. So uh, on the uh, Corker bill, I understand the, uh, the bill that passed uh, unanimously out of the Foreign Relations Committee is one the President would <coughs> sign, correct? Yes, in the, in the form in which it passed. In the form in which it passed. And I also understand the Republicans uh, who control the Senate now are very much into an open amendment process, and it's uh, a virtual certitude that an amendment uh, to stipulate that the administration would have to certify that Iran is not supporting terrorism against Americans uh, will almost certainly be added, be, be, be presented and would be added back onto this bill. If that were to happen, do we go back to where we were, which is a presidential veto? Uh, yes. The, the, there is an agreement that was reached, uh, a strong bipartisan compromise uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that the President has indicated he'd be willing to sign. But if there is an attempt, uh, and it succeeds, to undermine that compromise uh, and returning it to um, a, either a blatantly partisan vehicle uh, or a, a blatant attempt to undermine diplomacy, the president would absolutely veto that bill. Is that I mean, a tough argument to make that, that you would be vetoing uh, simply a provision that would certify uh, that the Iranians were not supporting terrorism against Americans? You really want to make that? Yeah. Not particularly. No, let me explain to you why. The first is that we know that Iran, for uh, at least a generation, uh, has been very active uh, in supporting elements of terror uh, around the globe. That is why they. Uh, are on that now shorter list of state sponsors of terror. Uh, and that is a designation that this administration takes very seriously. Uh, and there are a whole host of sanctions and other uh, ways that we have made clear to the Iranians that we have concerns about the way that they sponsor terrorism around the globe. Um, what we have also been clear about is that we do not anticipate that these nuclear negotiations are going to resolve our concerns about their support for terror. Uh, it is highly likely uh, that Iran will continue to be supportive of some terror elements, uh, even if they are able to successfully enter and complete these negotiations about their nuclear program. Now, what's finally is also true is that our need to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon is made all the more important because we know they support terrorism. That Iran's support for terrorism would be even more dangerous if we were dealing with a nuclear-armed Iran. That's what makes the stakes for these negotiations so high. Uh, and that's why we wouldn't want to see a politically motivated attempt to undermine uh, these serious negotiations. As you know, uh, many of our uh, 
Arab and Gulf allies uh, don't see it the same way and are very concerned that this agreement would actually uh, put Iran on the path towards becoming a, a nuclear power. I know you disagree with that. I, is the administration open to the idea that's been floated uh, by some of a mutual defense pact where the United States would would effectively guarantee the defense of our allies in that region uh, the way we do, say, with Japan? Well, the thing that we have said about our ally in Israel uh, is the President, I think, on a number of occasions has indicated how seriously uh, he takes the security threats to Israel. Israel uh, exists in a very dangerous neighborhood. Uh, and there are a number of steps the United States has taken over the years to show, uh, to demonstrate our commitment to their security. Uh, I think the most recent of those was last summer when the United States uh, ramped up our assistance uh, for the Iron Dome program, a program that was initiated in the Obama administration to protect Israeli civilians who were under threat from rockets that were being fired by extremists uh, in Gaza. Uh, but um, so that, you know, the, the United States is certainly committed to the um, to the security of the people and the nation of Israel. Now, I'm asking about our Gulf state uh, mm -hmm. allies, which have, have some of the very same concerns that the Israelis have. Uh, and of course, you'll be having the, the, the summit at Camp David. And uh, I'm asking if the administration would be open to the idea of a, uh, effectively a defense pact uh, with our Gulf allies. We're worried that this deal will pump in hundreds of billions of dollars ultimately into the Iranian economy and make Iran a more dangerous uh, exporter of terrorism. And, you know, they, they many have also argued that this ultimately puts them on the path towards becoming a nuclear power. Would uh, the United States be, would the administration be open to the idea of, of a defense pact? Well, the, one of the reasons that we've entered into these negotiations is because we do believe it is the best way for us to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, and the case that we will certainly make. And I think we'll have some uh, evidence to substantiate this claim that these negotiations would prevent a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. In fact, that is one of the reasons that we're pursuing uh, these negotiations. Uh, and we will certainly, we've made that case publicly and it's one that we'll continue to make in private as well. The second is we value strongly the military to military relationship that exists between the United States and so many of our uh, GCC partners, including uh, Saudi Arabia, and that military to military uh, cooperation is on display right now as Saudi Arabia engages in this military campaign uh, in Yemen to protect their southern border. Uh, and I'm confident that these are the kinds of conversations that we'll continue to have uh, with the leaders of the GCC countries when they uh, travel to the United States uh, in the next month or so to uh, have a long com longer conversation, an in-person conversation uh, with the President about all of these issues. Uh, well, uh, there's one other thing that occurs to me that I also uh, want to make. We have seen that the Iranian economy has been decimated by the sanctions regime that's been put in place, led by the, by the United States, uh, but uh, in cooperation with the uh, international community. Unfortunately, we have not seen that economic pressure lead to uh, a scaled back investment in terrorism, uh, that Iran's support for terrorism is as strong as it's ever been. Uh, and uh, I think the point is that there are some people who say, well, why don't we put in place uh, even more sanctions and we could probably convince uh, Iran to change their calculus. Uh, and the fact is we haven't seen them change their calculus when it comes to their support for terror. Uh, we, there are some indications that they might change their calculus when it comes to their nuclear program. Uh, and that's why we're pursuing this diplomatic opportunity that currently exists. So I don't have any doubt that the rebels in Yemen are supported by Iran, that Iran is ultimately what it, uh, the, the, uh, the force behind what we're seeing happening in Yemen? The latest assessment <laughs> that I've heard that, uh, that is not, uh, I haven't talked about this with anybody today, but the latest assessment that I've heard you know, in the last week or so uh, is that uh, there are indications that Iran is uh, supporting the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, what continues to be unclear, and there is some skepticism about, is whether or not there is uh, command and control uh, of the activities of the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, so in other words, there, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems probable that there are weapons and equipment that are being supplied uh, or other forms of support that are being supplied to the Houthis. Uh, but it's not clear at this point that the Houthis are essentially being uh, directed in how to use them. 
uh, but there's an ongoing assessment uh, of this. And I, look, I, the, we are clear-eyed about the risk that is emanating from Yemen right now, and that there is certainly a risk that the conflict there could uh, spiral into a broader, more regional conflict. Uh, and that is, you know, I listed previously a, a substantial number of reasons why uh, it's in everybody's interest to try to resolve this politically. Uh, in some ways, uh, that may be the most important one. Okay. Mara. Um, question about the comments yesterday from Abadi, and then in response to that, the uh, Saudi ambassador arguing about Saudi's regional ambitions versus Iran's regional ambitions. Um, just in light of what you just told John, um, how worried is the president about a full-fledged Sunni-Shiite conflict in the region? And um, how close is the president or the White House to having a comprehensive strategy to deal with that, kind of beyond just Iran's nuclear ambitions, you know, a bigger strategy to contain Iran's, you know, um, ambitions in the region? Yeah. Well, the I, I don't think it would be uh, particularly surprising to hear that this is something that, that, that we continue to be concerned about. Uh, and you know, it's precisely because this conflict is manifested uh, in much smaller conflicts, uh, but they do have the potential to spiral into much broader ones. So that's everything from the situation in Yemen that John and I were just talking about. Uh, that situation is manifested a little bit in, uh, in Syria as well, where we have seen the Iranian uh, regime trying to prop up the uh, an Assad regime that is under some pressure from their uh, Sunni neighbors. So uh, there is a danger of conflicts like that that start out as relatively uh, small in the broader, in the grand scheme of things, uh, spiraling into a much more dangerous uh, regional conflict. Uh, and that's why the uh, United States has tried to uh, pursue a a strategy of engagement with our many of our Sunni partners uh, and to demonstrate that we continue to uh, be concerned about their security situation. Uh, and that's also why we have worked so aggressively with the international community to try to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, that, that, that that regional rivalry that exists uh, would become far more dangerous uh, if one of the two parties in that rivalry were to be armed with a nuclear weapon. Uh, it, would make, it, would, it would create an incentive for the other party to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, it would greatly increase the risk of proliferation. Uh, and there obviously are uh, generational tensions that exist uh, that, again, would be only uh, more dangerous uh, if both sides uh, uh, is, uh, is nuclear armed. But if, but if the Saudis and the other Gulf states conclude that the deal with Iran will turn them into a very much richer, more troublesome nuclear power in 10 or 15 years and decide the best response is to go get nukes of their own. <coughs> well, that's then, why. I, I, right, and that's why we would, we're going to make the case, and there will be plenty of evidence to substantiate this, that that is why we're entering into these negotiations, is to prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Right. But, but the President himself has said that at the end of the period of this, of this agreement, they can, they're free to go ahead and race for a bomb again. No, I don't, I don't think that's at all what the President has said. There will be very strict controls that will continue to be in place uh, on Iran um, for a substantial period of time. The additional protocols, Secretary Moniz has talked about this, the additional protocols that would be put in place by the IAEA would be uh, inspections and verification measures that would be in place in perpetuity. Uh, and those kinds of inspections uh, are uh, a critical part of the foundation of this agreement. And that is something that we're going to insist uh, upon uh, because of the legitimate concerns that the United States has and that other countries in the regions, region, region uh, have about Iran's previous activity when it came to the covert uh, attempt to develop a nuclear weapon. But, but are you planning to offer some kind of commitments to the Gulf states to dissuade them from going out and getting nukes of their own? Well, we certainly do not believe that adding nuclear weapons to the equation in the Middle East uh, is in anybody's interest. Uh, I don't believe. I'm asking what you're willing to do to Well, we certainly are going to make that case to them uh, directly. We already have. Uh, and, you know, certainly one element of 
Well, let's, let me say it this way. Many of the Sunni countries may be in a position where they feel like it is in the best interest of their country's security to consider that approach. The other approach uh, is for them to continue to strengthen the security relationship that they have with the United States. Uh, and that there's an opportunity for uh, some of those countries to, uh, where they may choose to act in the best national security interest of their country by strengthening their ties with the United States. Yeah, one last quick thing on another subject. Does the President still have confidence in the DEA chief who was roundly savaged yesterday on Capitol Hill? Well, the, uh, the Office of the Inspector General in recent days has uh, published some pretty troubling details about the conduct of some uh, officers at the DEA. Uh, as you know, Mara, the President has very high expectations for everybody who serves in his administration. Uh, about their conduct and about keeping the public's trust. Uh, I know that these are uh, concerns that uh, have prompted the Department of Justice to take some steps to try to address them. Uh, and we're certainly supportive of the efforts that are underway at the Department of Justice to, uh, to, to address those concerns. Yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't answer the question. question. Uh, well, Does I, the President still have faith in the DEA? Yeah. Well, again, I, I uh, at this point, um, we're, we're, we, are, we do have concerns uh, about the, what's been reported by the uh, Office of Inspector General. Uh, we do have high expectations for those who serve this government and serve the American people. Uh, and we do believe it's important for the Department of Justice to do as they're doing, uh, following through on some reforms to address those concerns. Is it, is it fair to interpret that as saying that you feel she has not lived up to those expectations? Well, uh, again, I, I think it is, um, I, I think I've said all I have to say about this stuff. Uh, Pamela. Uh, the administration has told Congress it's working to resolve the issue of um, American fugitives in Cuba. Is the goal to get them back here, and, and what are the chances of that happening? Well, uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Justice that's principally responsible for uh, bringing to justice uh, American fugitives who may be trying to hide in other countries. Uh, this is not a situation that's unique to Cuba, as you know. There are uh, a number of other countries around the world where um, there are fugitives that the Department of Justice is interested in uh, uh, is interested in getting in touch with, um, and uh, those are you know th that that is true. Uh, what is also true is that the fact that a country may uh, have some uh, fugitives that need to be brought to justice here in America uh, does not merit their inclusion on the state sponsor of terror list. And I know that's the argument that's made by some. Uh, but it's not an argument that uh, withstands the scrutiny that's required by a serious designation like, a, like being added to the list of state sponsors of terror. Is Cuba's, uh, is the, is Cuba's willingness to work on this issue uh, the result of being taken off the terror list? Uh, no, it's a, it's a completely separate issue. I, I think that the uh, one of the things I think that we would expect is that as we start to take some steps to normalize relations between our countries, uh, that our conversations with the Cubans uh, about the need for the United States and the Department of Justice to have access to these fugitives might be more fruitful than they've been in the past. Would the U.S. consider sending back any people who are here that Cuba wants in exchange? Well, I, I, I'm not aware of anything like that that's being contemplated at this point. Okay. Byron. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Senate Republicans have previously floated the idea of using spending bills to challenge the administration's regulatory policies. And in an interview with us that published... It didn't work out great with the Department of Homeland Security, did it? Well, in an interview with us that published, granted, while you were up here, okay. um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell promised big fights over funding the bureaucracy. Can I get you to react to that, either specifically or generally? And does the White House have concerns about another shutdown? Well, I, I, Senator McConnell himself, I haven't seen the latest interview, but I did see the interview uh, that he conducted shortly after the election in which he promised that there wouldn't be any more government shutdowns. So, so I, I, I guess I'll, uh, I think I would anticipate that uh, we'll, we're going to hold Senator McConnell to his word. Um, I guess I'll have to read the story and find out if he's changed it. Um, switching directions a little bit. As a candidate, the president promised to use the word genocide to describe the killing of 1.5 million Armenians. Uh, he has not done that. 
does he plan, and this is the 100th anniversary, by the way, this year, um, does he plan to, to use that word and why or why not? Well, Byron, I can tell you that the president and other senior administration officials have repeatedly acknowledged as historical fact um, that 1.5 million Armenians were massacred uh, or, or marched to their deaths in the final days of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we've further stated that we mourn those deaths uh, and that a full, frank, and just acknowledgement of the facts uh, is in the interest of everybody, uh, including uh, Turkey, uh, Armenia, and the United States. Uh, that is our position. Uh, and uh, one of the principles that has guided the administration's work in this area uh, and in atrocity prevention more broadly uh, has been that nations grow strong by acknowledging and reckoning with, pain <laughs> with painful elements of their pasts and that doing so is essential to building a foundation for a more just and more tolerant future. You won't use the word, though, to describe those events. Well, this, is, uh, <laughs> this has been our, um, uh, our policy and our position and our approach to this issue for uh, a number of years now. Uh, it is customary for the, uh, the President to issue a statement on, the, um, uh, on this situation, uh, on this terrible uh, historical event. Uh, uh, later in the month of, of April. And I wouldn't anticipate any uh, updates in, uh, on our policy until then. Chris? If I can go back just for a second to the gyrocopter. Um, okay. And by the way, Jay Johnson said his first reaction was, what's a gyrocopter? Well, so I guess there's a little of that going around. <laughs> yeah. Um, the pilot had a blog where he wrote extensively about what he planned to do. He spoke, apparently, with Secret Service agents twice who came to his home. Uh, the local paper did a story on him, and the local reporter said he actually called the Secret Service while this uh, pilot was in the air. Does this raise concerns, again, that the Secret Service or security in Washington is not on top of things? Well, uh, Chris, what it does is uh, I think it illustrates just in a very vivid fashion uh, just how difficult a responsibility it is uh, for the Secret Service and other law enforcement agencies to ensure the security of the nation's capital. But uh, they don't often, I don't think, get a uh, heads up from a perpetrator or a, and, and, a, and a reporter who says he's yeah. in the air. Well, and I, and I, I know that the Secret Service uh, has uh, raised significant doubts about, uh, about that um, purported fact. Uh, I'd refer you to them. They're in a position to, to know. Uh, um, I can only repeat what they've said, uh, and they've indicated that, um, that they don't think that's true, but uh, I'd refer you to them to assess that. Uh, what they've also said is that when they first learned of this individual's uh, interest uh, in this endeavor uh, more than a year and a half ago, that Secret Service agents showed up on his doorstep a day later. and. Uh, again, I think that's consistent with the kind of uh, vigilance that you would expect from an, agent, from an agency that has such a very serious responsibility to protect the President, uh, protect the White House, and to work with other agencies to protect the nation's capital. On a sort of related note, the Commission on Fine Arts voted today, which is the first step to do something interim to the White House fence after the fence jumper. Um, the fence jumping took place in September. The independent report on that came out in December and said, and I'm quoting, it must be replaced as quickly as possible, and later said it should be done immediately. No one thinks the permanent replacement is going to happen at least until sometime next year. They're not even looking at a proposal until sometime this fall. Uh, is there any concern that this is just taking too long? Well, uh, Chris, I can assure you that everybody who's working on this issue has a sense of urgency to, uh, to deal with it. And uh, again, I just want to go back to highlighting the difficult equities that need to be balanced here. Obviously, the very first priority is ensuring the safety and security of the President, the First Family, and the White House. Uh, that is priority number one. But what is also important, uh, and this is also an element of their responsibility that the Secret Service takes very seriously, uh, is ensuring that the White House continues to be open to the public, uh, that there are large public tours that take place almost every day, uh, that there are large events like Greek Independence Day that can be hosted in the East Room of the White House where hundreds of people uh, attend, 
uh, that this is part of our philosophy when it comes to a government uh, of, for, and by the people. And yes, it's symbolic, but it's an important symbol. And I know that the uh, Park Service, um, the Secret Service, uh, and other agencies uh, are looking at the appropriate measures that can be taken uh, along the North Lawn and all around the White House complex to balance those two critical priorities. There are obviously some steps that have already been taken in the aftermath of some of the serious events that we saw late last year uh, to put in place uh, an additional barrier there outside the, uh, outside the fence that would strengthen the perimeter. Um, but for additional steps that may be contemplated, I'd, I'd refer you to the Secret Service, and uh, they may have more for you on this. I know that this is something that they're actively working on. Does the President get updated on any regular basis on this? I don't know that there's any sort of re regular, regular mechanism for updating him, uh, but, uh, and that's a testament, I think, to the uh, confidence that he has in Director Clancy and other professionals at the Secret Service uh, to handle their responsibilities and to take them seriously. Okay. Kevin. Hey, Josh, thanks. I want to take you back to Russia for just a second. Okay. You said earlier in the P5 plus 1 that they are, uh, they are playing a constructive role uh, in that process, and yet between, you know, buzzing our aircraft and selling missiles to the Iranians, uh, with friends like these, I think, is what a lot of people are wondering. Are, are the Russians friends? Are they foes? Are they frenemies? Are they somewhere in between? It just seems like there's always something. Well, uh, Kevin, the, we, I think we've articulated on a number of occasions that the United States does have a complicated relationship with Russia. And there are some areas where our two countries can work together very constructively in pursuit of interests that, are, uh, that benefit both our countries and both our people. Uh, and whether that is removing Syria's declared chemical weapons stockpile, uh, putting uh, astronauts onto the International Space Station, uh, or engaging in diplomatic conversations to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, uh, we can work constructively with Russia uh, in a way that benefits both our countries. Uh, that doesn't, however, uh, that obviously doesn't uh, prevent uh, Russia from doing some things that we do strongly disagree with. And when we have those disagreements, uh, we not only make clear that we're concerned about their behavior, and in some cases, we even take steps to uh, register our displeasure with their conduct. Uh, the flagrant violation of the territorial integrity of Ukraine by Russia is a classic example of that. Uh, and I think actually it's a testament to the uh, President's leadership that we can engage in taking very serious steps against Russia uh, that is having an impact, a negative impact on their economy to register our concerns about their activity in Ukraine. Uh, while at the same time looking for opportunities uh, to work together to advance the interests of the United States. Did you have the opportunity to sort of unpack what Vladimir Putin said, the uh, Russian president, about now that the sort of framework has been agreed to that, you know, not everything has to be on the sort of sanctions table anymore. He's using as an example the sale of the defensive missile uh, system to the Iranians as this is just a reward for their cooperation in the process. He even said today he felt like that this has been agreed to by the parties. Do you subscribe to that notion at all? No, because we've raised uh, very clearly and directly our concerns with the sale of this defensive system to the Iranians by the Russians. Uh, what is clear is that the sale, uh, while concerning, uh, does not violate UN uh, Security Council resolutions. Uh, and again, I would hesitate to speculate on precisely why uh, Russia is taking this step, but I know that there are others who have speculated that it's an indication of just how weakened the Russian economy has become as a result of sanctions put in place by the United States, that they're forced to take a controversial action like this just for the money. Uh, and that kind of uh, uh, desperation, I think, is an indication of how effective the international sanctions regime against uh, the Russian government uh, has been. Uh, but we're going to re relay those concerns uh, to the Russians directly. That's already been done. Uh, and we're going to continue to work with Russia in collaborative fashion to try to uh, reach a diplomatic agreement that will succeed in preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Last thing I want to ask you about uh, Loretta Lynch. Uh, the clock continues to tick. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've run out of uh, ways to describe the delay. I'm curious what, if anything, is the White House planning to do 
to uh, move this process along. Well, I'll, I have a new way to describe the uh, delay for you. All right. The the last seven, Mr. Uh, Mr. Schultz alluded to this yesterday, the last seven nominees for Attorney General waited a combined 24 days to move from the committee to a floor vote. As of today, Loretta Lynch has waited 49 days. So she's waited now more than twice as long as the previous seven attorneys general nominees combined to get a vote on the floor of the United States Senate. That is an unconscionable delay, and there's no excuse or explanation for it. Uh, it does, however, uh, prompt me to point out something else. Uh, I had the opportunity to tweet briefly about this uh, before the briefing started. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see that. Um, over the last six years or so, we've seen a lot of ink be spilled uh, about the challenges associated with the White House working constructively with Republicans in Congress. And there's been a, spot, a lot of speculation. Is it politics that prevents the White House from working, political differences that, pre that prevent the White House from working with congressional Republicans? Uh, is it uh, ideological or philosophical differences about policy uh, that prevent congressional Republicans in the White House from finding common ground? Is it that the President hasn't played golf enough with members of Congress uh, that they haven't been able to find common ground? I actually am ready to stand here and present to you Exhibit A in why it is very challenging to work with congressional Republicans. Back in September of 2014, shortly after Attorney General Holder indicated that he was prepared to step down as the Attorney General of the United States, there was a lot of speculation about how soon the President would nominate a replacement and how soon he would seek that person's confirmation. Uh, and in the days after that, uh, that Attorney General Holder indicated that he was prepared to leave. Senator Grassley, uh, appropriately relishing the possibility that Republicans would assume control over the United States Senate, said, rather than rush a, a nominee through the Senate in a lame duck session, I hope the President will take his time to nominate a qualified individual. So Senator Grassley said, I hope the President doesn't nominate somebody right away because this should be somebody who's considered by the new, hopefully Republican-led Congress. Just today, on television, on Bloomberg, Senator Grassley was asked about the delay. Again, citing the, the, the historic delay that she has faced. And he said, and I'm quoting here, if you want to subtract November and December from that long time frame, you should do it. The Democrats were in charge or in control of the Congress, and they decided not to bring her up. That, in my mind, is an astounding display of duplicity. And I know that it may be that you guys are looking at me, many of you have been in Washington longer than I have, and you're thinking that Josh really likes working at the White House. He's so idealistic. He's got stars in his eyes. He's so naive about the way that Washington works. That this kind of dramatic reversal and going back on one's word is just business as usual in Washington. The, 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 the sad part, I think, is that Senator Grassley, particularly in his home state of Iowa, has cultivated a reputation uh, as somebody who is true to his word. And I think the only conclusion that I can draw from this uh, astounding exchange uh, is that it's possible that Senator Grassley has been in Washington for too long. With that long wind up, Bill. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know if you've got anything to do <laughs> that. But you did mention and answer uh, to Chris a bit ago that the Secret Service had interviewed the pilot of the Gyrus uh, copter a year and a half ago. Is there, any, is there any concern around here that he wasn't placed on some kind of watch list and that you weren't notified when he next moved? I mean, doesn't the concern over the security of the president, above all, warrant such a move? Well, 
for the way that this individual was uh, handled and what the process is for handling these kinds of situations, uh, I'd refer you to the Secret Service. This is obviously, uh, they have developed procedures in place. But I'm asking about concern around here. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there are a couple of things that are uh, also relevant here, which is that in the, his extensive public comments to the Tampa Bay, to the Tampa Bay Times and others, he has not indicated a desire to harm anybody. He indicated that he was interested in fly through restricted airspace well, near but, the White House. But, but Bill, the, I think the intent, of the, the intent of the individual is relevant. Uh, it certainly is relevant to the, to the way that he is processed by the uh, investigative agency, in this case the Secret Service. Uh, it's difficult to stand here and tell you what uh, the Secret Service found in the course of their investigation. If there's more that they can tell you about that, I'd refer you to them. Uh, there also has to be a process in place for uh, evaluating these uh, kinds of instances that um, that law enforcement agencies are in the business of making careful judgments uh, about threats uh, and for, again for questions about how that's actually done I'd refer you to the Secret Service. So as long as he didn't seem to want to cause any harm it was okay to kind of show up. No I don't think anybody's making that case I'm certainly not. Uh, Prime Minister Biden. Um, Again, what has he asked for? He told people in a question and answer session this morning, we asked the U.S. to continue to support Iraq by providing weapons, training and advisors, sharing of intelligence, <coughs> and making public and private investments. But what has he asked for? We, all, we only know about the humanitarian relief. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Well, I guess, Bill, the, what, what I'm trying to say, and I think it sounds like uh, Prime Minister Abadi is trying to say the same thing, there's not a specific request that he brought to his meeting with the President of the United States. Uh, what Prime Minister Abadi has sought uh, is to travel to the United States uh, to deepen the relationship and coordination and cooperation that already exists between our two countries. Uh, the United States, uh, over the last decade and a half, uh, has invested uh, significant resources, uh, both in uh, the form of financial resources, but also in the form of our men and women in the military who uh, have fought and bled and in some cases died uh, to try to resolve the security situation in that country because of the impact it has on U.S. national security. And uh, this president uh, is committed to uh, pursuing a strategy that builds up the capacity of Iraqi security forces to take the fight on the ground in their own country to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And that's contingent on a couple of things. One is, and most importantly, it's contingent on a central government in Iraq that can unite that country to face down the threat that's posed by ISIL. And we are pleased with the early indications of Prime Minister Abadi's leadership that he's trying to do precisely that. That's going to be critical to their success. What the United States is committed to do is to marshal the international community uh, to bring a variety of resources to this conflict, uh, including military air power. And by backing the ground forces in Iraq with coalition military air power, we have substantially improved their performance on the battlefield, such that 25 to 30 percent of the, of the populated areas that ISIL previously controlled, uh, they no longer do. But in marshalling international resources, the U.S. will be expected to contribute as well. Mm -hmm. And we have contributed substantial resources in terms of uh, equipment, uh, in terms of training, in terms of advice, in terms of the kinds of uh, airstrikes that are being carried out, and in terms of uh, the humanitarian relief uh, that is uh, needed in that country, too. So the United States continues to be committed uh, to the success of what the President is acknowledged is going to be a longer-term effort. But to what extent, we don't know. Uh, to what extent? You mean in terms of the... the uh, continuing commitment. Well, I, again, I, the President has indicated very clearly that he is uh, committed to this effort. Uh, he recognizes that there are serious implications for uh, American interests and American national security. Uh, and the investment that we've made thus far is significant. And uh, there's no indication that that, um, that that investment is in any way waning. No, no, but what is the next tranche of that investment? Well, How again, much more? When? Uh, in, in terms of our military cooperation, we're going to continue to stay in close touch with the uh, Iraqis. We're going to continue to uh, conduct uh, airstrikes where necessary with our coalition partners to support their uh, efforts on the ground. 
Uh, we're going to continue to work closely with the Iraqis as they make decisions about where the military campaign uh, will move from here. Obviously, the Iraqi security forces have made substantial progress in the last couple of weeks. They, um, they uh, drove uh, ISIL fighters out of the city of Tikrit. Uh, there now you know, are more significant skirmishes uh, taking place in other locations in Anbar <coughs> province. Uh, we're very mindful of the very dangerous security situation that continues to exist uh, in Iraq, and we're going to work closely with uh, Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi central government to help them make the decisions and take the necessary steps to address it. Okay. Jim? Uh, can I get back to the gyrocopter for, for sure. one more try? Uh, wasn't this a pretty astounding security lapse here in the nation's capital? For somebody to buzz across the National Mall and land a gyrocopter on the, on the front line of the Capitol? Well, Jim, I think what it does is it illustrates uh, how difficult and dynamic the security environment is in the nation's capital. Uh, and we're certainly pleased that no one was hurt uh, in this incident. Uh, and he went, through, he went through three different uh, FAA flight restricted zones, uh, including uh, something called the P-56 zone, which is the zone around the White House, Vice President's residence, and the Capitol. Uh, apparently undetected, nobody tried to fly in and, sh and shoo him away. Uh, and was just able to come right in. I, I, I know it's a dynamic security environment, but that just seems like it seems like somebody screwed up somewhere. Well, right, uh, Jim. I, I think that what the FAA has said is that uh, this individual is flying at a uh, at a sufficiently slow speed and a sufficiently low altitude that it was difficult to detect uh, him on uh, their radar system. Uh, but again, this just illustrates again how. Uh, difficult it is for uh, these agencies to uh, secure uh, an area as large as the national capital region and to do it in a way uh, that reflects the need to allow for the freedom of movement and allow the uh, American public uh, to visit, visit the nation's capital. But rest assured, our security professionals at the Secret Service uh, are constantly uh, reevaluating security postures, trying to learn lessons uh, every day from additional steps that can be taken to uh, make the White House and the U.S. Capitol and the entire national capital region uh, even more safe. Uh, and I'm confident, again, that, uh, that there are security professionals are uh, continuing to review this incident to see if there are some lessons learned and some changes that uh, may be needed to, uh, to make us even safer. And on, on, uh, Loretta Lynch, is there any chance the President withdraws her nomination? Well, there is no question that she is an eminently qualified nominee. And uh, for all of the hue and cry and for all of the historic delay of her, uh, of her confirmation, there's no one who's raised a legitimate concern about her aptitude to do the job. Uh, and that's because she is, uh, has earned a reputation as a tough but fair <laughs> prosecutor. She's somebody who has put terrorists away for life. She's somebody who has prosecuted uh, public officials who violated the public trust. She is somebody who has prosecuted white-collar criminals uh, on Wall Street that have tried to take advantage of middle-class families or victimize middle-class families in some situations. So she is somebody in a variety of areas uh, has proven her mettle and proven her capability. Uh, that's why the President chose her to be the nation's top law enforcement officer. She's somebody who's, who has the strong support of law enforcement. She's somebody who has even the strong support of Rudy Giuliani. So. Uh, there is, she's somebody who got bipartisan support in the Senate Judiciary Committee when she finally got her hearing. So, you know, there is, um, uh, there is no reason, there is no reason why she shouldn't be confirmed today by the United States Senate. Yeah, but you're not tempted at all to, uh, to just let Eric Holder finish out, to sort of two can play that game? But you're not, you're not tempted to well, withdraw her nomination and just let Eric Holder stay in place? Well, the, the, the President believes strongly that she's the right person for the job. Uh, Attorney General Holder has indicated that he's uh, ready to, uh, to move on, and uh, this is the way that the, the system is supposed to work, that the President's supposed to nominate a qualified nominee, uh, and even members of the other party uh, are supposed to consider that nominee. And here's the thing. Members of the other party are also supposed to uh, give the person the benefit of the doubt. If they believe they're qualified for the job, they should vote for him. In this case, we already see that a large number of people in the other party uh, aren't willing to vote for her. But the worst crime is their refusal to even allow her to come up for a vote. Uh, it's shameful, uh, and it should uh, change today. Peter. Hey, Josh. Um, Governor Scott, Florida says he's going to sue the Obama administration 
for withholding money for hospitals because the state won't expand Medicaid. Uh, he says that the administration is cutting off federal money to force the state into uh, the Obama health care law. Uh, do you have a reaction to that? Uh, I haven't seen the specific details of the lawsuit, but what is true is that expanding Medicaid in the state of Florida would uh, ensure that <laughs> 800,000 Floridians would get access to quality health care coverage. Uh, this is the cost of providing that health care coverage would this year would be borne entirely by the federal government. So there's not a good reason why uh, anybody in Florida would be in a situation of trying to uh, block uh, a policy that would benefit uh, 800,000 Floridians. Uh, in fact, it would have a positive impact uh, on the finances in the state of Florida. Uh, and it's difficult to explain why somebody would think that uh, their political situation and their political interests is somehow more important than the livelihood and health of 800,000 people that they were elected to lead. Are you holding back money for hospitals as a result of this? Well, uh, for the details of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of this particular fund that's in question, I'd refer you to, the, to CMS. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that I uh, have heard about, but I don't feel confident explaining from here. <laughs> <laughs> is the White House involved in that decision? I mean, if, even if CMS is the one that is enacting it, does the White House make that decision or play a role in that? Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not, frankly, uh, aware of what precise role the White House would have played in this, but we can look into that for you. Okay. JC? Let me just continue on the conversation regarding Cuba and the discussion. Was there any discussion between President Obama and President Castro that may have indicated a return of Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, if you will, to the government of Cuba? Um, I wasn't in uh, for the entire discussion, but we have been very clear, uh, both in private and in public, uh, that uh, it is not our intent to, uh, uh, to return the control of uh, the military base at Guantanamo Bay to the Cubans. Are we, are we still leasing it from, from the Cuban government? Uh, I'd refer you to DOD for the, okay. the precise details of that arrangement. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Leslie. Thanks, Josh. Um, thanks, Josh. I had two quick ones okay. um, since Peter took the floor. Do you have um, any date yet set for the meeting of the Gulf leaders at Camp David? Uh, I don't yet. Uh, I know that we're uh, hoping to do this um, sometime relatively soon, but we'll get back with you as soon as we've got a date locked down. Okay. And also, um, who could you tell me what le the White House hasn't said yet whether or not it's going to send anybody to the Armenian commemoration later this month? Do you know at what level you're considering sending people? Uh, we haven't yet, but uh, we'll let you know as soon as uh, we've made that decision. So we'll have to get back to you on both those things. Okay. Tolu. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, on Greece, I wanted to ask if you're ruling out the possibility of the President meeting with the Finance Minister even informally and talking about the situation there. Uh, I'm ruling out any sort of formal sit-down conversation, which is what I understand was uh, initially reported on this. Uh, that will not occur. Uh, I don't know if there's any plan for a handshake and a photo or anything like that. Um, but based on the uh, news reports of the last couple of days, if something like that occurs, I'm confident that the uh, Greek finance minister will let you know. Can you talk a little bit about how engaged the president is on the Greece issue? Um, we just heard that the IMF rejected the, the request for debt relief, um, and we're getting pretty close to the deadline. Is the president pretty engaged in terms of making sure that Greece doesn't go into a default? Well, the president uh, is regularly briefed uh, on this situation. I don't know if it's daily, but it certainly is regularly. Uh, and uh, I do know that the president, on a number of occasions, has uh, placed phone calls to European leaders to talk about this situation. Uh, that typically happens with Chancellor Merkel, but I know that this issue has come up uh, in his conversation with other uh, European leaders. Um, principally, the, uh, this, the Treasury Department has been uh, the focal point of our efforts to work with um, the European nations uh, to resolve this situation. And so it's Secretary Liu uh, and other senior officials at the Treasury Department have been focused on this. And uh, again, this is the weekend when um, many world leaders are in town for the uh, IMF World Bank meetings here in Washington uh, over the course of the next few days. And I would expect that Secretary Liu would be uh, <coughs> engaged in some conversations on this topic with his counterparts uh, over the next few days. Cheryl? Thanks. Um, the Senate is said to be close on reaching agreement on trade promotion authority legislation. I'm wondering if that's your understanding, if they're close, and also whether the White House could support the direction they're going. 
Well, the, uh, I do understand that they have, uh, that based on a lot of hard work over the last few weeks, that uh, they've made important progress. Um, I always hesitate to predict that Congress is going to do something before they've actually done it. Um, and this process, I think, given the complexity, it's understandable that there have been a lot of stops and starts associated with it. Uh, but uh, the White House uh, and senior administration officials, including uh, our uh, United States Trade Representative Mike Froman, have been involved in conversations with uh, staff and members on Capitol Hill uh, on this issue. Uh, and so we are uh, encouraged by the progress that they've made so far, but I'd refer you to um, members and staff on Capitol Hill to give you a, a, the latest assessment of their progress. Okay. John, I'll give you the last one. Actually, two. But I'll okay. Be really quick. I'll give you the last two. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you. Um, uh, the first one, just your reaction, the administration's reaction. The House today uh, voted to repeal the estate tax. Wanted to get your reaction to that. Well, uh, I think this is, uh, as you've heard me say before, this is a very vivid illustration of the different values and priorities uh, between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to tax policy. Uh, Republicans believe that uh, it's in the best interest of our economy to offer a $270 billion tax cut just to the wealthiest 0.1 percent of Americans. Uh, the President believes that we could actually better use uh, about that same amount of money to offer substantial tax cuts to working families. Uh, and there's just a difference in approach. Republicans believe that if we offer uh, those significant benefits uh, and tax credits to the wealthy, that the economic benefits will trickle down on everybody else. Uh, the fact is the President believes that we can take a more direct approach uh, and that by offering some relief to middle class families, uh, we can actually not just lighten the burden for those middle class families, we can actually ensure the longer term strength of our economy by doing so. The one thing, the one irony I will point out uh, in this process uh, is that when the President talks about his desire to bring uh, some relief to the burden that's borne by uh, middle class families, the prompt response that you get from Republicans on Capitol Hill is, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, but what House Republicans have just done is passed a $270 billion tax cut for the wealthiest 0.1 percent uh, and are just going to put it on the tab of the deficit. Uh, so uh, it is, um, some might even call it hypocritical, uh, but it certainly is, in my mind, at least ironic. My, my other question has to do with some comments that you made in response to my colleague, uh, colleagues Kevin question a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you, in the course of responding, you referred to uh, Senator Chuck Grassley as duplicitous. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? I think I refer to his comment as, du as duplicitous, but yes. Is that helpful to the process of, of getting Loretta Lynch nominated? Is that helpful to uh, building relations with the party that controls the U.S. Senate, do you think? Uh, I'll just observe, John, that being nice has gotten us a 160-day delay. So. Maybe after they look up duplicitous in the dictionary, we'll get a different result. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.